The Bible is a large collection of books from antiquity, containing many mysterious stories about serpents, dragons, godmen, prophets, and wars. Dr. Bart D. Herman will be explaining this large collection of books and its influence on the world. Dr. Bart Ehrman is going to be on the channel to answer questions about the course that's coming up about Moses and the Exodus and Jewish law. The name Moses turns out not to be a Hebrew name, but an Egyptian name, and it does show up in the names of some pharaohs, like Tough Moses, and so there's nothing to suggest that he was based on any other historical figure that we know about. People like to talk about the Hicks explosion and the Israelite Exodus, but do you think they're related? The deal is that Egypt was a place that people immigrated to sometimes groups took over and then ended up being driven out and it kind of sounds like in the Old Testament when Joseph becomes second-hand to Pharaoh and then his people are driven out. People were saying that the story of the Hyksos invasion is based on actual events, though the dates don't work very well because the exodus happened long after the Hyksos were out of there. There is no archaeological evidence for the exodus, and there are some disputes among scholars as to whether there is some historical basis for the exodus. The text talks about tents, the archer, and the covenant, but there is no archaeological evidence for those things. The deal is that the book of Exodus itself and the book of, of Numbers indicate that the Israelites left Egypt with two and a half three million people and that's more than the population of Egypt by a long shot. One of the things that shook my faith from hearing about this was that the text tells you that they're starving and thirsty and then all of a sudden they're ready to go to war and fight against the Midianites. When Pharaoh tried to chase the Israelites, he gathered together 600 chariots and 3 million people. The Israelites were afraid of this, but a thousand people to attack each area didn't seem to be a very fearsome prospect today. The city of Pyramses was built in the middle of the 13th century and suggests that the pharaoh at the Exodus was Ramses II, but we know that he and his entire army get wiped out after this event would have happened. I think that what you just said defeats the Hyksos theory because it's 200,300 years after the Hyksos and if it's Ramses II then the Hyksos thing doesn't work right. What you could do is imagine that there are records unconnected with the Bible of Semitic groups going down into Egypt. Moses raises a serpent in the wilderness and makes a fiery serpent puts on a standard it says if anyone who's bitten looks at it he shall live. Do you have any idea what this even means? The book of Numbers is very interesting it's about what is happening to the children of Israel as they've disobeyed God and so they're going to spend 40 years in the wilderness. During this time, God punishes them by releasing deadly serpents and so Moses makes a bronze serpent. The serpent is an important figure in the New Testament, and the Gospel of John uses it to compare Christ to the serpent on the cross. I like where you're going with this. And I also notice in Leviticus that they have a ritual where they let a goat free and then slaughter another goat as a sin offering. Do you think the New Testament accounts of Jesus' death are being allegorized with the scapegoat sacrifice? It's a little bit tricky to work out the analogy because in the Christian tradition Jesus' death takes sin upon himself and dies, but how do you work that out with a goat? I've actually thought about this, and I wonder if they're polemicizing the whole temple thing. I think he actually says outside the gate outside the walls of Jerusalem which is your point only kind of exaggerate a little bit because it's not Jerusalem the holy city where the temple is and the sacrifices are Hebrew the book of Hebrews makes a very big point that Jesus is superior to everything in the Jewish system. There are several incidents where Moses has an encounter with God and they're narrated in different ways, but the most impressive one is in Exodus 20 where God is portrayed as a theophany, an appearance of God where there's thunder and lightning and clouds and dark. Dr. Bart Ehrman is here with a new upcoming course about the Gospel of Mark, and he answers some questions about the things that Mark tells us about Jesus that the later Gospels try to fix. Mark is a different book from Matthew, Luke, and John. They all have their own distinctive message, and Mark's is interesting in part because Matthew and Luke copied Mark for part of their story, and changed it in places. Mark really wants to stress that during Jesus' lifetime nobody could figure out who he was, so he orders people to be silent when they recognize him, and he is transfigured in front of three of his disciples, but nobody in his lifetime could figure that out. Mark's portrayal of Jesus is different from the earlier Gospels, and he is never called God. In the Gospel of John, he is called the Logos, who was there in the beginning and he created everything. The Son of God can mean a variety of things in the Old Testament and Jesus is clearly invested with authority that's not available to most people in the Gospel of Mark, but the question is if Jesus is divine in some sense. Christians in the early church thought that when a person was taken up to heaven at the end of their life they became a divine being. Mark may have the idea that Jesus became the Son of God at the baptism, but he's not God in the sense that he created the universe, 
there's no evidence of him pre-existing, and there's no virgin birth. When the Arians came along they all agreed that all the Gospels agreed on everything, so they weren't able to say that Mark didn't have a certain view, but the ideas in Mark carried on and there were people in early Christianity who had more of Mark's view. The earliest mentions of the Messiah are not of the Jewish context. Instead, they are of a man chosen by God. Mark deals with what the Messiah is supposed to be, and he tries to show how Jesus could be the Son of God and the Messiah, even though the term Messiah is a Jewish term and Jews meant something else by it. From Jewish writings from the time including the Dead Sea Scrolls, we know that Jews thought about a Messiah who would destroy God's enemies, establish Israel as a great kingdom, and rule that kingdom a real kingdom here on earth. Mark begins his gospel by saying that Jesus is the Messiah, but everybody knows that Jesus is somebody who got crucified by the Romans for crimes against the state and Mark is trying to show that Jesus got crucified because he was the Messiah. I think that the early Christians redefined the Messiah, because they believed that Jesus was the Messiah, and they were driven to do that right away. Marcus probably wrote about four years after Jesus' death and I think right after Jesus' death some of his followers started thinking like this because the second they started saying Jesus was raised from the dead they started thinking that maybe they had the wrong idea about Jesus. Mark begins his gospel by saying that Jesus was born in Bethlehem to fulfill prophecies made by Isaiah the prophet. He then quotes Exodus Malachi and Isaiah to show that John the Baptist was the one that the prophet had predicted would be Jesus' forerunner. Mark is coming at this with a sort of mystery feel, and I think that's one of the things that makes him a great piece of literature that everybody misses because they just read it so quickly. If you pay attention, you find all this stuff, but if you pay attention really carefully, you find that Jesus keeps it secret, and the debate has gone back for over a hundred years, where scholars are trying to figure out what they call Mark's messianic secret. Mark is trying to show why Christians today call Jesus the Messiah even though during his lifetime people weren't calling him the Messiah and maybe he's portraying the women as the ones who figure this out and the disciples didn't. The author of Mark flips the narrative and says that this movement is for everybody, including the people at the temple. The fig tree, an image of Israel, withers up and Jesus curses it, predicting the destruction of Jerusalem. Jesus is definitely raised from the dead in Mark's gospel, but the women are the ones who find out and never tell anybody. The origins of the gospels are discussed, including the dates of their writing, how they got their names, and how they were named. The common view is that Mark was probably the first gospel written around the year 70 of the Common Era. The books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written 40 to 65 years after Jesus' death, and they are written anonymously in Greek. The authors were well-educated, Greek-speaking Christians, and they were not Jesus' own followers. The first time anybody mentions Mark is a church father named Papias who says that Mark was a secretary Peter and he wrote down everything that he heard Peter say about Jesus and he mentions Matthew and Mark doesn't mention Luke or John in our surviving accounts. Scholars have thought that Luke and Acts could have been written by the same author, but I'm not completely convinced that they were. The literary style, the hand, the writing style, the themes, the theology, the beliefs are all very consistent throughout Luke and Acts. I think it's probably right that the original version of Luke started with chapter 3 verse 1, that the original version of Acts did not have the birth narrative of Jesus being born in Bethlehem to a virgin, and that both books were almost entirely written by the same person. Scholars have analyzed the text very carefully in degree and have looked for writing style on a very complicated level including things what kind of conjunctions does this person use how does this person use ellipses. If you analyze a ride map well you can see pretty well if it's almost certainly the same author or possibly not and if you carefully read Luke and Acts and try to understand it as a gestalt you will see that Paul converts in chapter 9. Peter has a supernatural vision that informs him that Paul's view is going to be right and Paul starts on his missionary journeys. The subject changes, but it's necessarily going to have a change of topic. I think what's going on is that you get different kinds of Christianity in different parts of the growing Christian community throughout the world. Different places have different forms of Christianity and in the early church that's how it happened because they didn't have mass communication. So the four Gospels have different points of view and you have to take them individually. In Mark's Gospel Jesus' entire message is that a kingdom of God is coming soon and you need to prepare for it by repenting of your sins otherwise you're going to be destroyed. Jesus doesn't teach about who he is in Mark and he doesn't talk about his identity in the Gospel of John. He talks about his identity as one who has come from heaven to earth. In John Jesus constantly talks about his divine identity, and in Mark he never does.
he does miracles to prove who he is, and in John he actually tells us that's why he does miracles. The four Gospels are different varieties of Christianity, but they were chosen by church fathers to be the New Testament, so there are basic continuities among these four. They are read as if they're saying the same thing, but they are also crazily different. The reason why I bring that up is because if you look at how the Gospels are portraying Jesus it seems like there's a big variety in the beginning and then it sort of swells goes down into a church. In the 1930s, a scholar named Walter Bauer realized that Christianity was not one thing, but a wide variety of views that were fighting over which view was right. This led to the Catholic Church, which was a consensus view that got rid of a bunch of views. Dr. Bart talks about the word virgin in the Old Testament and how it appears in the Hebrew versus the Greek which becomes sort of a theme in the New Testament because obviously Jesus is born of a virgin is this a mistake or on purpose? Isaiah says that a young woman who is pregnant is going to have a child and that before the child is very old the two kingdoms will disappear and will no longer be a threat because God is with us. Matthew's account of Jesus' birth uses a Greek translation that means woman's never had sex, even though Isaiah doesn't talk about a woman's never had sex or a prediction of a woman who's going to give birth later. Christianity didn't grow out of a mistranslation because the 27 books in the New Testament only mention the virgin birth twice and the authors didn't think the verge of birth was a critical component of the Christian faith. The doctrine of the virgin birth may have originated from a misunderstanding of Matthew or from someone pointing out that Jesus really had God as his father and then somebody came up with a virgin birth story. Some ancient people or gods were born of virgins, some of them were not as true as others, but there are some prime examples of actual virgin births. There are stories in Greek and Roman mythology of gods getting women pregnant but you also find it with historical figures like Plato the philosopher Plate is Pythagoras Alexander the Great. I mean these are people who said their parents actually were divine beings and so there's no doubt that that happens all over the place but my question is were any of these women virgins and if not then why are Christians coming up with this? In the second century there were some Jewish Christian groups that thought that Jesus was not born of a virgin and there were some pagan circles that thought that Jesus was born out of wedlock and there was a specific rumor that his mother Mary was raped by a Roman soldier named Panthera. The virgin birth story is an older tradition but it's also mentioned in the New Testament only two times. One explanation for why you get a virgin birth story is that one of the early mid-2nd century authors who's hostile to Christianity mentions this about this one part. Scholars take this story seriously, because the sources are from the Jews. The earliest reference we get to this rumor is in the 2nd century and it's based on earlier sources so sometime in the mid-2nd century at least we know that this was a story that was floating around. The name Panthera sounds similar to the word Parthenos, which means virgin, and so it's thought that Christian Suzanne was born of a Parthenos. The chance that Jesus was born of a woman who was raped by a Roman soldier is virtually nil there were no soldiers posted in that part of the world the Roman soldiers weren't playing everybody imagine Roman soldiers were all over Israel making sure people don't do something wrong. Outside of Christianity, there is significance coming from other religions about a virgin giving birth some sort of is this a thing that not just Christianity but other religions are taking seriously for someone who is divine or somebody who's like the chosen one or something like that. One of the questions I want to deal with in the seminar is whether there are any virgin births in other religions and if so does that play any role? Dr. Bart, what does it mean for someone to say they were born of a virgin apart from Jesus what do our sources say about miraculous famous births such as Hercules Romulus Alexander the Great Apollonis and Tiana and lastly were their mothers virgins? For years I thought that there must have been an empty tomb, but 10 years ago I started looking into it and I don't think so. I'll talk about Jesus not being in the tomb, Paul doesn't say anything about it, the others don't say anything about the tomb being empty. When Romans crucify somebody what happens to the body? Most of them don't say anything about what happens in the remains, but when they do talk about the remains they always say that the bodies were left on their crosses to decompose so that the birds would eat them. I don't think Jesus was buried on the day he was crucified because Romans didn't do that and there are only a couple of exceptions to that rule that are really highly exceptional so I talk about this in my book How Jesus Became God. Pilate was known for being completely ruthless, but he didn't take Jesus' body when there were hundreds of people lining up in protest because Jesus was a nobody and Pilate didn't want to risk a riot. I don't think there was an empty tomb, but many scholars think there was because several early Christians had visions of Jesus. I think that Peter, Mary, and later Paul thought they saw Jesus alive afterwards and that the writers of the time period didn't know who Jesus was yet.
Do you think that it was such a small group of followers that no one knew who Jesus was until later on? People think that Jesus fed 5,000 men at one time, and that there were crowds everywhere. Since Philo and Pliny the Elder didn't mention Jesus, they think that he didn't exist. The high priest was the key figure in Israel at the time, but Jesus wasn't mentioned by any of the great historians, so it doesn't mean he didn't exist, and it's impossible to exaggerate his importance now. At the time, no historian would expect those people to mention Jesus, and also, paper papyrus parchment was not cheap and easy to find, and you had to find a stride who can write, and also, sometimes, you had to take animal skins and do some sort of intense process to make paper. Suetonius writes that Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome because of riots that were instigated by Crestus Christus and for a long time some people thought that this was a reference to Christ Christos but that sweet Tonys just probably didn't understand anything about Christophs. Josephus writes about brother of Jesus in one area of his writings they also write about Jesus who is called the Christ and my question is how much of that do you think is interpolation how much of that do you think is originally written by Josephus? So it's a debated issue whether Josephus mentions Jesus or not, but it's not an insurmountable problem because there are other people named Jesus that he records events about. There are two references to Jesus in the writing to Josephus in his book The Antiquities, and one of them is a story about James, who is the brother of Jesus who is called the Messiah. In Book 18 he has a paragraph about Jesus where he says that he was the Messiah, that he got in trouble with the leaders of the Jewish people, and that the Roman authorities executed him. The Jesus was a teacher who did amazing things and got crucified because and so it seems to confirm the basic outline of what we know about Jesus historically and from the early Christian sources but did Josephus write that? Josephus, a persona known grata among Jews, wrote a section about Jesus that was preserved by Christian scribes, and the general thought is that what happened was that Josephus wrote some basic things about Jesus and they got in trouble with the law and they crucified him. Richard Carrier wrote a book about Jesus not existing at all and just being a mythological character, but I think the historical Jesus exists. I think the strongest argument for a historicist is that Jesus had to be from Bethlehem to be tied to David. To me this is why I'm a historicist, however, I do want to know about the historical Jesus and what can we definitively know about him if you take apart the mythology. Scholars across the board who are actually trained in this field are just not talking about it because the evidence is overwhelming and it's not even a discussion among physicists and astronomers because we know it's not hollow. Scholars agree that Jesus existed, but there are some things they disagree with. The mythicists are completely right that there are things recorded about Jesus in the New Testament that did not happen, but that doesn't mean he didn't exist. There are certain things that almost everyone agrees on about Jesus, including his age his hometown, his religion, his ministry, and the fact that he was crucified after getting into a fight with other Jewish teachers. The majority of people who look at the evidence without bias agree that Jesus was real, and many other people agree that his father was a Roman soldier named Pantera. Is there anything to this claim? The Jews took this pretty seriously and put it in their Talmud. Do you think there's anything to this or is it just nonsense? Jesus' birth was unusual. Two of the Gospels say that he was born of a virgin, and there are suggestions that he was born out of wedlock. There are suggestions in the Gospels that Jesus was born out of wedlock, and that Christians later claim that he was born of a virgin because Mary was a virgin. However, there is no way to demonstrate one way or another. The Talmud shows that there was a Jewish idea floating around about Jesus, and that the pagan critic Celsus also suggests this idea. If people think that Jesus is born illegitimately, they come up with the idea that his father is a Roman. The proprietors said that Jesus' father was a Roman soldier, but the logic of it is that the word Pantera sounds a lot like the word for virgin in Greek. I think that the historical Jesus was not born a Roman soldier, because there were not Romans in Nazareth, and there were not Roman soldiers in Galilee, because the Romans were not everywhere, and there were not Roman soldiers in Nazareth, because these are poor people who never travel. Talmudic friends would say that they were talking about our Jesus but they were doing it in code, and that's why some people say that there was a different Jesus. Paul doesn't really mention Jesus' father until Luke and Matthew, and both have Joseph in their genealogies as being related to David. Do you think this is a reason why Joseph wasn't mentioned in Paul's letters? The name Joseph is used in the Gospels, but we don't know anything about his parents, his virgin birth, or anything else about him. It's probably just a joke, and there's nothing significant about it.
I don't think Joseph was invented to give Jesus a Davidic lineage because Jews didn't keep records and couldn't even read, so nobody would have known what his lineage was. Matthew and Luke both give a genealogy of Joseph tracing back to King David and to Abraham, but these genealogies differ from each other so that they're not getting from the same source, and it doesn't matter what you call them as long as you have the genealogy going back to David. We don't have physical evidence for any other person in Jesus' time period, except for the high priest Caiaphas, who was buried with Jesus. We don't have information about anyone else, because of the nature of our surviving sources. For years I thought that there must have been an empty tomb that whatever however you might want to explain it we just have overwhelming evidence that there's the tomb was empty and now I don't think so. Jesus wasn't in the tomb, Paul didn't say anything about it, the others didn't say anything about it, and people just assume it happened. I looked up everything I could find in Greek and Latin authors about crucifixion and they all said that the bodies were left on the crosses to decompose so that the birds would eat them. In the ancient world, people wanted a decent burial for their dead and the Romans were flipping them the bird by not letting them bury their dead on the day they were crucified. So I don't think Jesus could have been buried on that day. I don't think anybody even knew about a tomb, and I don't think the Romans would have let a Jew like Joseph Arimathea just come in and take him down. Pilate was known for being completely ruthless and didn't give a damn what the Jewish authorities thought. When hundreds of people lined up in protest, it wasn't Pilate's style to take care of things. The early Christians believed that Jesus got physically raised from the dead because several of them had visions of him and if you think you see somebody alive after they're dead that means they got raised from the dead. The writers of the time period were applying to the Elder Road and Encyclopedia, but they didn't seem to know who Jesus was yet. Do you think that this small group of followers is why no one knows who Jesus is yet? People think that because the Gospels say that Jesus fed 5,000 men at one time and that there were crowds everywhere that he didn't exist or that he didn't have all those followers. When Jesus was a teenager, the high priest Annas the father of Caiaphas was a very important figure in Israel. Why would they mention him so often let alone some itinerant preacher? Jesus from Galilee who's got a small following and ended up becoming the most important person in the history of the Western world wasn't at the time because paper papyrus parchment was not cheap and easy to find and it took a lot of effort to make it. When you're talking about mythicism versus historicism, it's hard to know if the cross day's character mentioned in the text is the same person as Jesus. Suetonius is writing about an action undertaken by Claudius, a Roman emperor, about 30 years after Jesus' death, and Suetonius says that Claudius did this because of some uprisings of some kind, and the uprisings were instigated by Crestus. The theory is that Crestus was the person who started the riots because there were Christians and Jews who were following Jesus as the Messiah, and they were fighting in the streets. So Crestus kicked them all out of the room. We don't know what the situation is we don't know whether it's riots over whether Jesus Messiah or if it's some kind of controversial figure named Crestus that's led to some kind of riots we don't really know but it's a good point the last thing I want to touch on is the Josephus interpolation. Josephus mentions Jesus twice in his book The Antiquities, which traces the history of the Jewish people from Adam and Eve up to Josephus. Josephus seems to be referring back to Jesus in chapter 20 the last when he says that James is the brother of Jesus who is called the Messiah. Chad in Book 18 has a paragraph about Jesus where he says that he got in trouble with the Jewish leaders who handed them over to the Roman authorities who then executed him. Josephus wrote most of what we know about Jesus, but not all of it. He says Jesus was the Messiah and that he was raised from the dead on the third day to fulfill the scriptures. Josephus was a persona known grata among Jews throughout most of history because he was thought to be a traitor to the Jewish cause during the Jewish war. Josephus wrote a section about Jesus and then his scribes added a couple lines to make sure people understood who this was. This would explain why you have a reference in chapter 20 to Jesus the one who's called the Messiah. Joseph probably did say something about that and the verse about going back to the book 18 about James makes it seem like you can't really interplay both but if you actually look at book 18 it opens up about Pilate the guy who kills him so it does fit. If you think about Pilate and the things he was doing in Jerusalem, you're going to think about Jesus and the way he was killed. So I think it fits, and I don't think it's an interpolation. Why didn't they go for it and say that James is the brother of Jesus the Messiah? If they had said that, then they would have said something about him instead of just saying that he is an elusive thing. I deal with this kind of material all the time on my blog, and I answer questions and deal with comments. I use it to raise money for charity and today I'm going to talk to you about the topic of left behind which is a phrase a lot of evangelicals throwing around.
The rapture is a doctrine that many millions of Christians believe, but it's not in the Bible the first time somebody came up with the idea of this rapture before the tribulation on earth was in the 1830s. Pope Sylvester II was based off the book of Revelation, which talks about the Satan being chained for a thousand years, and then coming back. So people were waiting for something else. Paul says that when Christ returns the dead and Christ will rise first and then we who are alive who are left at the time will be taken up with them to meet the Lord in the air but what people fail to notice is that right after he says this he continues with the same thought. Paul was not writing in chapters, he just wrote the next sentence and it's clear he's not talking about Jesus coming to take people out of the world to prevent them from being destroyed, he's coming to destroy his enemies. Paul uses language that is similar to ancient texts that talk about what happens when a king comes to a city and then brings him back to rule. Christians are going to do the same thing, but not for seven years. Jesus thought that the end was going to come within his generation, but his followers thought that he was talking about a cosmic judge who was going to come and destroy his enemies and set up a kingdom on earth. The thought developed fairly quickly that Jesus first was going to allow time for the gospel to be spread throughout the world so that more people would be saved and so Paul thought he'd be alive when it happened. Every generation has thought that Jesus said it soon, and now 2,000 years later people are saying that it's going to be soon, but the Bible says that God's time isn't like our time. If you're pretty sure that Jesus is coming back in three days, you can start looking for him in the year 5023. Paul talks about a cosmic judge of the earth not himself and then takes this idea and says that some of you are asleep. Sleep in the New Testament is euphemism for dying, and in the followers of Jesus thought that you're not permanently dead. The woman in Revelation 12 gives birth to a male child who will rule the nations with an iron scepter. The woman who's giving birth to this one and that the dragons start looking for and trying to kill the dragon in the new in the book of Revelation is the devil and the one who's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. The church is sent off into the wilderness to be persecuted by the devil, but then she is chained for a thousand years. How is this passage interpreted over time, and what do people say today about this passage? John Patmos talks about a thousand-year period on earth after the Battle of Armageddon, where the martyrs of Jesus rule with Jesus. The thousand-year millennium is a metaphor for the rule of the church on earth and is happening now. Satan will be bound and will not be able to do any harm during this millennium and so this was the interpretation for most of history until the 1830s. Augustine thought that the thousand years were almost over, but Pope Sylvester too thought that it was almost over, too. So how do people deal with it after it comes? There's a book written some years ago that argued that this whole Sylvester thousand thing wasn't a big deal, but there were people who thought it was going to end possibly in the year 1260. Most theologians thought that the millennium was going to happen in the church, and Christ was going to come back at some point and destroy his enemies. There was an idea that Christ could return before the millennium. St. Augustine believed that Christ would return after the millennium, but a premillennial view developed that Christ would return before the millennium. You mentioned 1260, this is a time period where the Mongols are huge, the Holy Roman Empire is huge, and the churches started saying that maybe the Islam is going to keep Jerusalem. Why is this year so important? The thinking was started by one person, Joachim of Fiori, who thought the three periods were written into the history of earth because he believed in the Trinity. The period of the Father was all of time up to from Abraham when God chose Abraham to be as his the leader of the future people and according to the Gospel of Matthew the period of the Father ended in 1260 years. Well the last thing I want to ask you is what do you think is pushing people to keep expecting the rapture every two years and why they keep expecting it? The novel series Left Behind by Timothy Lahey and Philip Jenkins is based on the modern thinking of the rapture happening. I have a length or discussion of it in my book Armageddon, but the short answer is because people think that life has to be better than this, and the suffering happening in the world now can't possibly get much worse. I would look around of course people have always said that and now with the invasion of Ukraine and the whole thing in Israel going on, I think that the end is going to come next week, and this has very bad effects on society. I think the rapture is a bad view to have, but more than that I think you can show that it's not what the Bible teaches, and in my lecture I'm going to be trying to show that this is a foreign idea that's imposed on the Bible by people who are taught this idea. It's going to be an all-day webinar, with four lectures and a lunch break, and I'll answer as many questions as I get. The Christmas story really happened, and so what do we know about the birth of Jesus if anything we've got legends, history, and plausible stories? And so, I want to ask you about your book.
In the second century, there were many different Christian groups that claimed to be followers of Jesus and had support in biblical writings for their views. Some groups said there were 12 gods, some said there were 36 gods, and some said there were 365 gods. The views are just so far all over the map you would think that after a few hundred years things would split off, but no. Paul attacked other Christians who had false views that completely disagreed with his, and he didn't have their writings. The Martianites and Ebionites were on one side, and the Proto-Orthodox were on the other. The Marcionites are followers of a man named Marcion who said the God of the Old Testament really is not the God of the New Testament and that the God of Jesus is not the Creator not the God of the Old Testament it's a different God. So you have people who are completely opposed to Judaism and people who are embracing Judaism who are both claiming to be followers of Jesus and then you have Gnostic groups that are really bizarre by modern thinking. Mark Ion went to Rome and tried to sell his version of Christianity to the Roman hierarchy but they rejected it and kicked him out of the church so he went around Asia Minor and started his own churches. There were areas in what's now Turkey that were predominantly Marcionite this was the kind of Christianity they had and I would say that a lot of Christians today are still Marcionite you know a lot of Christians say yeah we don't follow the Old Testament you know. Jesus was God, he seemed like a human, but he wasn't, and today many people don't think he was a human. Marcy and I agree that the Trinity defies mathematics, and that's why Christian theology developed, but it's also why you hear about different denominations today, and you think they're so far apart. If you compare the Martianites and the Ebionites to the Greek Orthodox and Mormons, they're actually closer together because they agree on who Jesus was. They have all sorts of things in common that are different from these anxious groups. Okay so the Gnostics were proto-Orthodox Christians who believed that knowledge was the way of salvation and that it's not Christ's death that brings about salvation it's the secret knowledge that he revealed that allows people to escape the material trappings of this world to return to their spiritual home. In the writings of Paul, you can see why this is considered heretical, because Paul talks about knowledge being insufficient, and even gets into being works being insufficient. James disagrees with Paul, but I think he's talking to later Christians who took Paul's teachings to an extreme. Paul taught that a person cannot be made right with God by doing the works of the law, but later Pauline Christians taught that you can't be saved by doing good things. This is not how Paul would have put it. The back and forth in the epistles that people call contradictions I used to think that it was a black and white thing but now I think that it's more like a platonic not a dialogue but like a here's different situations and here's how you handle them kind of thing. I think Christians today take for granted the fact that they have to believe X, Y, and Z about Jesus but back in the earlier days they didn't have to believe anything. The way I would put that is before you start getting these creeds developed in the 4th century you had different groups that had different beliefs and there was no standard um but in the 4th century they started developing creeds that became more standardized.